Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help out by clicking the like or subscribe button. You can also donate using the Patreon link in the description below. So I'm excited to be back and I've got a great show for everybody today. I am pleased to welcome James Oliviero from Checkpoint Therapeutics. James, welcome to the show. Hey Matt, thanks for having us. Yeah, well, I think you guys are doing a lot of interesting stuff, so I thought it'd be great to have you on so we could talk a little bit more about the different programs you have going on. And I think the, the first thing that might be great is if you could give just a little bit of background on Checkpoint and what you guys are looking into. Yep. Uh, so happy to tell you all about it. So Checkpoint uh, was founded in uh, 2015 when it licensed in an, an antibody portfolio from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. Uh, between that and also licensing in a small molecule EGFR inhibitor from a Chinese company uh, that really uh, formed the company uh, that we have today. And, and the focus of this company is licensing in uh, interesting uh, compounds that can treat solid tumor cancers, uh, developing these programs from preclinical into, uh, into clinical and one day hopefully commercializing uh, these molecules. And so our company right now is focused around the two lead development programs, uh, one being Cosabellumab, which came out of that Dana-Farber portfolio, mm -hmm. an anti pdl one antibody that's differentiated from the ones that are on the market today, and I'm sure we'll talk a lot about mm -hmm. that. Uh, and the other lead molecule is the third-generation EGFR inhibitor that uh, could be differentiated as well uh, mm -hmm. from a safety standpoint from the uh, leading drug that's on the market today. Great. Yeah, and obviously your furthest along program is, is Cosabellumab, and yeah, so anti pdl one and obviously it's a huge market. PD, the PD-1 space checkpoint inhibitors have garnered a significant amount of revenue, um, but what makes Cosabellumab different than another pdl one that's out there? Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly large market. I mean, today they're, they're selling as a group about $25 billion annually, and it's expected to grow to approximately $50 billion annually. And it's driven by the fact that these drugs, these immuno-oncology drugs, work in so many different indications. I think they're approved in 25-plus indications. And so um, there's room for multiple entrants. And ours, as I mentioned earlier, is differentiated from the ones on the market today, and it's differentiated through its twofold mechanism of action. The primary mechanism of action is similar to the leading PD-1s and PD-L1s, and that's by blocking that PD-1, PD-L1 pathway, mm -hmm. uh, being able to reactivate the T cell response to do the job of the immune system, which is to come in and, and destroy the tumor. Uh, we do that uh, as well as the leading antibodies out there today. Mm -hmm. But what we bring to the table with this specific antibody that the others don't do is by having a second mechanism of action. And that's by having what's called a functional FC region of the antibody. And while having this functional FC region, whatever we bind to, uh, we recruit in a different part of the immune system called natural killer cells to come in and essentially attack what we're binding to. And so that's called ADCC. So we believe that potential for ADCC can augment the efficacy brought about by our antibody beyond just reactivating T cells, what this uh, class typically does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think the, the material, is it IgG1, the functional antibody part of Cosabellumab? This is an IgG1 antibody, okay. yeah, and that's that's related to the fact that we essentially left the antibody alone. We it does, okay. you actually have to engineer out of the FC region if you want it to to deactivate it, and that's what the leading antibodies did. Okay. Uh, we left it natural uh, to do what we think can augment the efficacy by the fact that we're binding to the tumor cell. We think that natural killer cells can just uh, complement what we're doing with the T cell. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, and that's a, a good opportunity to kind of do better than what these drugs already do, which is pretty impressive. So yeah. when it comes to the different indications, I think I've seen uh, metastatic squamous cell carcinoma cell is like the uh, furthest along program. What other indications are you looking at? Yeah, so the, the furthest along is our pivotal program in metastatic cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. That's the second most prevalent and second most deadly skin cancer uh, behind melanoma. Uh, we also have our pivotal program in a, a little bit earlier stage called locally advanced cutaneous mm -hmm. carcinoma, and that's proceeding uh, along very nicely as well. 
And beyond that, the next step for this program is we want a piece of the lung cancer market. Mm -hmm. So we're starting our phase three in first line non-small cell lung cancer in combination with chemotherapy. Uh, we're starting that uh, next quarter. And so that's a study that can hopefully uh, give us access with success to part of that $10 billion market that's dominated today by Keytruda. Yeah, and, and I think the, the market cap that you guys are sitting at is in the, the mid 200 million right now. So if uh, we could see some progress there, I think it would be huge for the, for the company. So it's pretty exciting uh, price point right now that you guys are trading at. Yeah, there's a lot of room. I mean, it doesn't take much to generate meaningful sales in a $25 billion overall market of PD1, PDL1s. And certainly where we're trading today, I think, is very attractive for investors to take a look at. Mm -hmm. um, because again, we're not far away from our pivotal results expected later this year. And I think that can really be a transformational event uh, for the company, not just for our development program, but also how investors look at us as mm -hmm. we are potentially launching on the market in 2023. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, to connect what you were saying about the differentiating factors of cosibelumab, um, there is some interim data so far in uh, cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma. Um, and I think the one thing that stuck out to me is complete responders seem to be double what LibTio saw. And LibTio is another PD-1 drug, and it's uh, currently indicated for the, the same uh, disease. Is that right? That, that's correct. Lipteo is, I believe, the market, still the market leader. Keytruda is also approved uh, in this indication. And so uh, what you're referring to is our complete response rate in our interim data and seeing how it compares to the initial label uh, from mm -hmm. Lipteo. So typically complete responses with IO therapy uh, take, you know, several months, mm -hmm. you know, probably on average 10 to 12 months uh, to occur. Um, what we've been seeing with our drug is uh, very encouraging is that we've been seeing a lot of complete responders happening earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, in the end, we have to look at our full data set and see how it compares um, you know, to uh, the ones on the market today. Uh, uh, but we're very encouraged by the early results, and we think that could be an testament to the fact of this potential ADCC component of the antibody coming into play. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, uh, these aren't head-to-head -head studies, yeah. right? Uh, we're not going up against those on the market today. So um, what we're going to end up with, ideally, is we'll be viewed as a comparable product mm -hmm. uh, to the PD-1s on the market today. And then the real differentiation that we're going to bring to the table is really part of our strategy is we are going to look to disrupt this market from the, the standpoint of the pharmaceutical pricing that's there mm -hmm. today. Pharmaceutical companies are charging incredibly high amounts, prices for their, the drugs on the market. They're all about the same price for this mm -hmm. class. And we expect to come in substantially lower in price uh, to a point where we don't expect any pharma to uh, match that price. And I think mm -hmm. that's really going to make a difference in this marketplace. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I did notice that in your corporate presentation about being being able to be more competitive on price is going to make it easier for payer support and also just to, to help patients get access. But do you worry at all that other companies uh, won't also race to the bottom with pricing? Or, or how do you think the company, how do you expect to pivot if, in fact, a lot of these other PD-1s um, start to lower their price? Yeah, so I think there's other companies that may take a similar strategy. I think it's a, it's a great strategy for smaller companies. Mm -hmm. You typically don't see small companies come into a cancer market as big as this. Usually they get sure. you know, acquired and gobbled up. Um, but this is really the opportunity to, to make a difference because a smaller company doesn't need to charge 165000 per patient per year like the farmers are charging uh, to have perfectly adequate margins to drive incredible growth at this company. You know, they're charging these pharmas these high prices in order to continue to grow their, you know, very high $100 billion, $200 billion market caps. But the, the unique thing about this class is the fact that these drugs by pharma are approved in so many different indications, and they can't price and match your price in one indication that you come in with. They would have to lower their price in all of their indications. And so they would essentially be shooting themselves in the foot over billions of potential of revenue that they're uh, reaping in if they wanted to match us in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma or our second indication that comes after that. So mm -hmm. I think there's room for additional entrance with a lower pricing strategy. Uh, but the fact that I think we will be the 
first and likely the only for quite some time in cutaneous squamous cell carcinoma using this strategy, I think is, um, you know, what's going to really separate us out and allow us to hopefully become market leader pretty quickly in that $600 million indication cut out from the $25 million that's there today. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, and, and that does make sense. The The overhead in sort of a large pharma needs to be sustained, and for them to take a haircut on, on pricing would hurt them a lot more than, than it would hurt sort of a smaller company. Yeah, I, it, it's only upside for us, as yeah. you mentioned, with our value today. So, um, you know, even at half the price of what pharma is charging today, we'd have over 90% gross profit margins. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's how insane yeah. prices are today from pharma. And so I think we can make a real difference in not just the U.S., but the entire world. It, there's parts mm-hmm. of the world that have no access to I.O. I'm talking mm-hmm. about countries like New Zealand, mm-hmm. countries like, you know, Poland has limits. New Zealand doesn't reimburse any I.O. today. Oh. It's 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 really a shame that so many patients ex US have no access to these life saving drugs. And so part of our strategy is also to hopefully have partners in place outside of the US that would like to take a similar strategy, and then they can access a lot of patients that you know mm-hmm. aren't apt today that ha- you know that could be you know influenced and and treated with this mm-hmm. type of drug. Yeah, yeah, I didn't really think about that. I think we we always focus on on the U.S. It's so easy to do so, right? Um, but for for you guys, is it makes sense obviously to start with the FDA and then kind of branch out from there. Yeah, it sets the stage, and then you take that filing, and then you you manipulate it to, to then go to other regions. And also, we're likely going to look for partners outside the U.S. Okay. I've built commercial before in the U.S. at my last company. I'm going to do it again here. I intend to commercialize here in the U.S. Uh, unless somebody you know comes in and, and, and wants to pay up for this. But mm-hmm. outside the U.S., I think it makes more sense for a small company to partner with a commercial uh, partner that has boots on the ground and can really uh, focus in on their territory. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Totally. Um, okay, so then for this indication in particular, if you saw similar interim results in the final data set, would that be successful in your eyes to move forward with registration? Yeah, so in the study that we're running, let's just talk about the metastatic yeah. cutaneous squamous cell study. So uh, the patient enrollment is about 75 patients. We completed the enrollment uh, this past May, in mm-hmm. mid-May. And what we need in our, you know, per our discussions with the FDA and what the, the study's powered to, to show is we need a 36% or higher objective response rate by central review. Okay. When we looked at the data and what we reported on at the last medical conference, CITSI, late last year, is we reported on about half of those patients uh, looking at the investigator-assessed ORR, and we we're tracking at about 50%. So well higher than mm-hmm. the minimum that that 36% we'd need. So that gives us a lot of confidence that when we have the data for the full 75 or so patients that we enrolled, uh, we're going to uh, you know, surpass that threshold. And again, anything above 36%, uh, whether we're 40%, whether we're 60%, in the end, we're going to be viewed as comparable because, again, these aren't head-to-head studies. And so in the end... The pricing is really going to be what differentiates and mm-hmm. gets the payers on board, and then that can change physician behavior pretty quick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I definitely think so, and and that's great that uh, yeah the interim data was so much higher than that cutoff. It, it bodes well for for Q4. So then we're still expecting data in Q4, and then after that, what's the registrational timeline look like? Yep. So we'll work uh, with a successful study. We'll work to submit the BLA as quickly as possible. It takes a couple of months to sure. you know, do all the report writing and submit it. So let's call it mid 2022 uh, okay. submission. Um, and then following an FDA review, we would hope to be having a, a launch in mid 2023. Okay. Very cool. That's uh, that's exciting. To me, that's the, the biggest near term readout for you guys. Um, but you do have other stuff going on with regards to EGFR. But before we talk about that, I'd like to thank our sponsor, which is Biofarm IQ. BPIQ is a research platform for smaller mid-cap biotech investors. BPIQ manually sources and compiles info for over 550 companies, including over 1.8 thousand of their drug assets. Some of the key features of this includes a searchable catalyst calendar and pipeline screener, the ability to look at company profiles and pipelines, as well as look at their entire drug profiles, which includes different catalyst dates, drug history, mechanism of action, and more. And the thing that I love about BPIQ is that it saves me an enormous amount of time. 
Trying to scour the corporate presentations for important catalyst dates can take forever. And rather than needing to waste all that time at each individual company site, you can go to bpiq.com, punch in the ticker symbol, and you'll get all of this information in a matter of seconds. Try BBIQ for free or lock in the current pricing while it lasts. I would recommend going with the annual package, which lowers the cost of BPIQ to only $12 per month when you buy annually. So check that out. Use their link in my description below so that they know that Breaking Biotech sent you. And with that, let's get back into the show. So I think first, if you give a little bit of background on, you know, what makes EGFR an attractive target in cancer? Yeah, so EGFR, ep epidermal growth factor receptor, it's a protein um, that sits on uh, cells, healthy cells, as well as, as cancer cells. And it's essentially what it sounds like. It's a growth factor. It, mm -hmm. it promotes cell division and, and growth. And when uh, EGFR has mutations in it, what happens is it, it stays in essentially the on position and it keeps dividing the cell, dividing the cells and mm -hmm. essentially growing a tumor. Um, and so what they found in non-small cell lung cancer is that patients that uh, have these EGFR mutations, and you can uh, assess for that very easily with either a, a biopsy or even now looking at, at a plasma or a blood sample, uh, patients that have these EGFR mutations with non-small cell lung cancer respond very favorably uh, to the class of therapies. It's a targeted therapy mm -hmm. uh, called EGFR inhibitors. Right. And so uh, EGFR inhibitors have been around for quite some time with mm -hmm. earlier generation drugs, first generation and second generation drugs. And then a drug came along uh, called Tigriso from mm -hmm. AstraZeneca. And this drug being a third generation EGFR inhibitor uh, inhibits more of the mutations, including resistance mutations uh, beyond what the earlier generation drugs mm -hmm. did. And so uh, that drug showed superiority over the older generations and has been essentially uh, building a monopoly now. It is the standard of care here in the US, um, selling about $5 billion today annually. It's, I think, the biggest selling drug at AstraZeneca. Uh, and it's, it's a very good drug, uh, but it has no competition. And so we have a drug similar in terms of profile uh, preclinically, uh, third generation EGFR inhibitor that in the clinic thus far has shown uh, signs that it could be different on safety. Uh, Tigriso has its safety profile. It has uh, some, let's call it, um, hang-ups from cardiovas cardiovascular effects as well as uh, interstitial lung disease, scarring of the lungs. Uh, we haven't seen any of those types of AEs. Of course, our drug will have its own safety profile, but I think it can be different, and I think that could be very interesting uh, to this large market where approximately 13% of patients can't tolerate Tigriso, and that comes right out of their, their label. Uh, so there's room for more entrance. Again, similar to our strategy, we would expect to be much lower priced. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the, really, the, the object is to get this on the market and, and carve out a piece for ourselves. Yeah, that's that's huge. And yeah, when I saw that 13% who can't tolerate the drug, uh, it makes me wonder what these patients end up doing if they can't use it. So yeah, chemotherapy primarily. Right. Uh, after you fail or you know go through Tigriso, at that point, there's nothing uh, that that really works. Chemotherapy is the best chance they have. So that's the next frontier, mm -hmm. by the way, for a targeted therapy or some sort of combination. And that's what another thing that we're going to look to uh, potentially take advantage of is we're very interested now that we have doses, proposed commercial doses for cosibelumab as well as our EGFR inhibitor. Uh, we're going to start focusing in on potentially combining the two together and having a proprietary combination. And I think the perfect patient population is that unmet medical need of patients that fail to GRISA. Hmm. I'd love to be able to show that we can safely treat these patients and then induce a meaningful response rate having that combination together. Yeah. Um, I think it would be unique to us, and I think it would be a very exciting uh, thing to work on. So that's, that's something we're focused on. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And we didn't really touch on the safety of cosibelumab, but I think I saw that the grade three or greater um, treatment emergent adverse events was quite a bit lower than something like Keytruda or Updevo. And so maybe you could tolerate, a, or a patient could tolerate the combination of that and CK101. Exactly. I think cosibelumab, our anti pdl one is the perfect combination agent as the backbone of combination therapy using mm -hmm. a PD-1, PDL one And that's because pdl ones have a much, in my opinion, better safety profile than the PD-1s. And that's been shown now mm -hmm. statistically in meta-analyses. Uh, because we bind to the tumor cell, 
while the PD-1s bind to the T cell, you see much lower rates of the immune-mediated adverse reactions, particularly the severe ones, hepatitis, pneumonitis, colitis. Uh, these are serious adverse events uh, that come about. And if you can keep those to a minimum, uh, you might see a much better synergy with a targeted therapy or another immuno-oncology therapy when you start putting them together. And that's exactly what we want to start doing here at Checkpoint. Hmm. That's very cool. That's uh, I didn't see that in your corporate presentation. <laughs> uh, it, it's coming. It's coming. It's, it's very coming. cool. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of things we can do now that we're in our pivotal studies sure. with the two lead programs, as far as potentially combining them together, and that's mm -hmm. really what we're thinking about, and we want to start putting in place over the coming months. Okay. Very cool. So for CK101, there is an ongoing phase three study, and I think it's in in China. Would you characterize that as a pivotal study? Hopefully. I think it's absolutely a potential okay. registration study that we can use. It is absolutely a registration study for our Chinese partner okay. who's running that study in China. Um, we actually just spoke with uh, the FDA. We, it's known that we were going to speak with them, and it does uh, sound like they are amenable to our using that study if successful as our pivotal study. Of course, we'll have to do um, our own other supplemental pieces of the program and that can support the NDA. But I do not expect that we will need to repeat a phase three study uh, versus an active control. I think we're going to be able to utilize our partner's study. And generally, these this class of drug, EGFR inhibitors, they're primarily developed in Asia to begin with. Tigriso uh, recruited over 60% of their patients from Asia. Uh, other TKIs have been over 70% of the patients from Asia, and the reason is there's just so many patients there to enroll because the mutation rate in Asia is about 50% in non-small cell lung cancer, as opposed to in a westernized patient population, it's more like 15%. And so it's just a genetic thing. So primarily, these drugs are developed in Asia, and so it's nothing new uh, in this class and nothing new to the FDA that obviously we're going to go heavy into Asia to enroll these patients. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder why that is such a difference in, in the mutation rate, but um, that definitely bodes well for potentially the FDA looking at it as registrational. And I think one other thing regarding this study I was curious about is, uh, do we have a timeline on when we might see some initial data? Yeah, so uh, at this time, I'm, I don't think there's any planned interim analyses by our partner. Our partner is running the study, uh, so they are they are setting the timeline. Uh, we don't want to uh, step on their toes and announce anything that they haven't announced, but uh, they're enrolling it. There's just a lot of patients there. I think they can enroll it uh, fairly quickly. Um, and my best estimate right now is that the primary analysis could be uh, done in probably the first half of 2023. And, um, you know, as we get more information from our partner, uh, we'll, we'll look to share that with the street. Very cool. Okay. Um, great. I think moving on from your programs, I was kind of curious about your relationship with Fortress Bio. And as I understand, they're a majority stakeholder in the company. Can you speak a little bit to the relationship you have with that company? Yep, so Fortress uh, Biotech uh, is the, you know, formed this company. They used to be, we used to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Fortress. Mm -hmm. uh, today, after essentially spinning out and going public, uh, today they own about 20% okay. of the company. However, uh, part of the founding of the company is they do retain voting control until such time as there's a full change of control of the company, meaning an acquisition of the company. Uh, so they have voting majority, but economically they own about 20% of the company. Um, uh, other than that, they, they provide some, a few back office um, synergies for us that we can utilize and they can, they can look to uh, put among their different subsidiaries. But we operate very independently from them. Uh, we have our own uh, CMC, our own, uh, okay. our own clinical group, our own CFO, CEO. Obviously, we are a very independently run company. We have a majority independent directors. Uh, so, you know, while they're there to support us, we, you know, we, we do run independently from uh, Fortress in terms of the actual business. Yeah, and I think you could get the best of both worlds having just another group that's experienced in the space to kind of bounce ideas off if you need or resources to leverage. Um, and I think one name that stuck out to me was Michael Weiss from TGTX, who's involved in seemingly like all the companies. Um, do you leverage their resources, Michael or other people, for whatever that might be helpful? 
Yep. So uh, Michael Weiss, CEO of, of TG Therapeutics, uh, he's done a great job. TG has been incredibly successful with their programs. Uh, today, they're a, a multi-billion dollar company, uh, you know, due to the success of, the, of those development programs. So uh, certainly congrats to him. So Mike is our chairman. Uh, he's incredibly supportive in in our uh, our business plan. Uh, he helps oversee the company. Uh, TG itself is also our partner on our PDL1 and our BET inhibitor that's uh, still in preclinical, but uh, hopefully going to be entering the clinic in the coming months. Uh, they sub license from us the rights to the hematological field for the PDL1 and the BET inhibitor, mm -hmm. and essentially with their success in their development programs, they essentially pay off. Our, our milestone obligations to our licensor, in this case with the PDL1, it's Dana Farber. Uh, we also get to leverage, obviously, their people uh, in the preclinical phase, and it uh, it was just a, a very good economic deal for us, and we get a royalty then on top of uh, it all when they do reach the market with these drugs. Right, very cool. Yeah, that seems like a nice uh, synergistic collaboration. and. I, I did want to touch on this as well. You mentioned they get the royalty for the HEMOC, but you guys are going to be looking in solid tumors. Is that right for the BET right, inhibitor? So they owe us a royalty on their sales in okay. the hematological field. Okay, uh, And we have exclusive rights in the solid tumors, and we owe a royalty to Dana-Farber okay. on both, right? Um, on and on any net sales. So our focus is on solid tumors. Most companies, it's hard to focus on both solid tumors and mm -hmm. hematological cancers. Our focus is on solid tumors, and um, and that's exactly what we're doing, and and uh, hopefully going to be on the market in you know two years from now. Mm -hmm. Very cool. So if so, for the bet inhibitor in particular, we're still preclinical. Any chance we have a timeline on when we might see data or anything like that? For yeah, the, so the in the clinic, the, I mean, mm -hmm. the non-clinical programs complete. It's IND ready okay. uh, at this stage. I believe TG is going to do the first in human study and set what is the appropriate dosing and dose regimen for that drug. Uh, what we plan on doing is then taking that dosing regimen and then applying it to solid tumor indications. You know, we could essentially start off likely with a phase two um, with okay. with the. Uh, and it's really about then finding interesting solid tumor indications where inhibition of BET uh, could be useful. Uh, and ultimately down the line, uh, the goal again is combining these therapies together. I think we could potentially use our PDL1 and that safety profile to enhance the effects of the BET. Uh, so I think the synergy is there. So uh, again, these are things that are coming down the line over the next year or two, hopefully for for this company uh, that can be next in line as Cosibelumab and CK101 are in the forefront today and moving forward towards hopefully commercialization down the road. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's awesome. It's it's great to hear all these upcoming programs too. And just to touch on another one, uh, Gitter glucocorticoid induced TNFR related protein. That's another collaboration you have with TGTX. Yeah, that one sublicensed as well, the hematological rights. That's another antibody uh, that came in from Dana Farber. Uh, Gitter's a very interesting uh, target scientifically. It's an agonist rather than an antagonist like PDL1. Um, the idea was, again, we thought we could use, uh, find the synergies between an agonist and an antagonist. Uh, to date, from competitive programs, Gitter has not seen utility as a target. Uh, similar to, for example, Ox40 and other agonists, Gitter just hasn't shown really much activity, uh, and we haven't seen anything encouraging from combination programs either. So mm -hmm. while we did a lot of work on Gitter, it's sort of on hold now until we see something more validating for that target, and then we can quickly move it into the clinic as a fast follower uh, type of approach to bring it forward. But mm -hmm. for now, it's, it's, we did a lot of work on the manufacturing. It's, it's ready to move forward towards an IND, uh, but we'd like more validation before spending a lot more money on it and bringing it forward. Yeah, that, that's fair. Very cool. Um, that's awesome, James. So that's pretty much all the, the questions I had for you. Is there anything we didn't really cover that you think you'd like to share about Checkpoint? I think we covered it all. I think uh, Checkpoint is a, um, a company that's just not really watched today. Uh, I think a lot of people out there just don't know that we have these pivotal results coming out at the end of the year. And uh, I think as we approach uh, further along this year, I think uh, we're going to get a lot more attention from the investment community. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we're looking forward to telling this story. I think uh, this is going to be 
uh, hopefully the next TG Therapeutics. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we're excited to be here. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I also think it's a compelling story. And definitely when the Pivotal program comes around or the announcement of the results, I think people might, uh, might regret not paying attention sooner. Um, so with that, is there anything you'd like to point people to? Do you have like a Twitter? I mean, the website is, well, just Google Checkpoint Therapeutics. Yeah, so our, our website has all our corporate presentation as well as our, our latest, latest press releases. You're going to see a new website uh, hopefully very soon, by the way. Um, and that's where you get the information. I'll be presenting at uh, banking conferences in July and into the fall, and I look forward to keeping uh, the investment community updated. Okay. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, James. I really do appreciate it. James Oliviero, uh, CEO from Checkpoint Therapeutics, and we're going to wrap it up there. But thanks, everybody, for paying attention, and we'll see you next time. Thank you, Matt.